All right, let's get started. So welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we are going to be diving into the world of GLTF and USD. Uh, this first slide may be a bit misleading because it's definitely not everything you need to know as you'll find out that uh, USD is fairly complex, but this should give you a pretty good understanding of what the differences are, what people are talking about when they talk about USD or GLTF or GLB or USDZ or any of the other uh, myriad extensions uh, for 3D files that people might be talking about. I want this to be really practical in terms of you being able to make use of this knowledge either in a conversation or thinking about how it works for your workflows. So if you have questions, I've got time at the end to answer those questions. But if it's super pressing, I do not have a problem if you uh, want to raise your hand on Zoom and I'll try and uh, answer it for you. All right. Um, so who am I and uh, why should you listen to me? Uh, so I'm Ben. I'm one of the co-founders of Ventana. Uh, this will not be a sales pitch on Ventana in this presentation, but for those of you who don't know, Ventana is a 3D infrastructure platform um, designed to manage, optimize, and distribute 3D files at scale. So you can think of it as a 3D digital asset management system that automates all of the conversions, the optimizations that you need to have your files work on e-commerce, B2B showrooms, Google, Amazon, et cetera. So that's a little bit about Ventana. If you want to learn more about us, you can find us at ventana.com. Uh, feel free to reach out to myself or my co-founder, Ashley, after the event if you want to uh, talk more. So why you should listen to me is all I do every day is 3D in and out. And uh, my job, especially since I am not, I don't come from like a technical 3D artist background, is to try and make sense of all of the uh, technical information that's out there and make sure that it's relatable to our customers that we're building the right sort of product. So this is what I do every single day. So before we get into uh, the differences between um, GLTF and USD, I think it's really important that we talk about real-time 3D because that is kind of like what underpins everything that's happening right now. So real-time 3D is what it sounds like. It is where a model is being rendered in real time. What you're looking at right now is not actually real time 3D because it's a video. So it's been pre-rendered. The examples that you're probably most familiar with as it relates to real time is any experience you're gonna have on the web. So if you're interacting with a uh, 3D file on an e-commerce site or something like that, that's real time 3D. If you're using augmented reality on your phone, that's real time 3D. When you talk about Unity or Unreal Engine, those game engines, they're all working on real-time 3D. And so, again, what it means is that everything is happening in real time. So as you move a model around, change the angle that you're looking at it, it is rendering a new frame. So how does this differ, how does this differ from regular 3D or pre-rendered 3D or offline 3D? So think about like Toy Story, think about the images that you might have when you're generating uh, uh, renders for Clover Browseware. That's all pre-render offline uh, rendered 3D. What that means is basically just that there's a, there's a lot more complex calculations that are happening and it might take minutes or hours to get out a single image or multiple images if you have a video but it's not interactive, right? It's predefined of, of what we're going to get. We're going to get an image of uh, this outfit at this angle, and that's what you get with pre-rendered 3D. So also think about V-Ray and things like that. If you've heard those terms before, V-Ray relates not to real-time 3D, but specifically to uh, pre-render. So why am I talking about this? Why does this matter? Well, it, it matters because it's the whole reason that GLTF came into existence because there really wasn't a very good standardized definition for uh, a format for 3D that would work in real time, it would work in all of these new applications that were coming up, web, AR, the popularity of, of Unity and Unreal, there's all VR, there's all of these new applications that have been coming online over the last decade or so. And so that kind of led us to create this format called GLTF. So unlike OBJ and FBX, um, 
it's very well standardized. So a lot of people think like, oh, an OBJ is an OBJ or an FBX is an FBX. Honestly, there's a huge amount of room for interpretation, specifically in the um, DCCs or the, the digital content creation programs. And that leads to all sorts of problems when you're trying to move those files around. So what is GLTF? Uh, GLTF or graphics language transmission format is a specification for the efficient transmission uh, and loading of 3D models by application. So basically think about it as a standardized way to format 3D files so they can easily be read and rendered by different uh, DCCs as well as applications. So the idea here is that it's standardization, that once you have it, it should look the same wherever you are um, using it, provided you've got the same sort of render setting set up. People describe it as the JPEG of 3D. So in the way that JPEG is kind of can be consumed anywhere by anything, it's very simplified format. That's what GLTF is for 3D. Um, commerce was a huge part of this. So a lot of this was driven by the fact that more and more people are shopping online and are engaging with these 3D experiences and think about all the different brands out there. There's, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of different uh, brands and artists creating 3D content. And without this standardization, it just wouldn't work. So as a 3D artist, two of the things that you want to think about with GLTF are how do I need to set up my materials? So what's different about the GLTF material? And does it change anything about my geometry? So for the most part, you're not going to have to do things that are that different from what you're used to when you're using GLTF. So you can model the same in your program. Um, you think about this more as like an export format. The big difference is that GLTF requires that you use PBR materials. So earlier I had mentioned V-Ray and uh, some of those other pre-render material formats. Those are not set up for real time, which is GLTF. PBR stands for physically based materials. So you want to make sure the materials you're using are going to work uh, in GLTF. What that means is that you're going to have a diffuse map, a normal map, uh, a metallic roughness map. Those are the main ones. And sometimes you'll have like an ambient occlusion map. Having the standardized materials and understanding that is like super, super important. If you get that right early on in your organization, it's going to let you do so much more later because one of the big pain points people have is they've set up their, their um, materials specifically just for the renders, which makes sense because it's the number one use case for 3D is people are generating uh, renders as opposed to traditional studio photography. The challenge is when you want to go and use these assets in a more interactive way, it's not going to work. And you're going to have to go back and rework those materials. Uh, we have a huge amount of documentation on this on our resource section on what that looks like for different programs and how you might be able to convert the materials or adjust them so that they will work properly. Um, I suggest you check it out. We're going to send an email after this with a bunch of links to some of the stuff that I talk about. So that's what you should be thinking about with the material side of thing is are my materials PBR uh, compliant? On the geometry side, because this is another question that comes up a lot, GLTF automatically triangulates your geometry. So if you're used to working in quads or something like that, what's going to happen is it's going to triangulate when it gets converted to uh, a GLTF model. So GLTF is meant to be like a publishing format. It is not really meant to be a format that is used uh, for back and forth editing on files. So if you have a, an asset that's already, the geometry is already in quads, you want to animate that asset, you want to do something else with it, leave it in whatever format it's in. Um, it could just be in, you know, a .3ds file if you're in 3ds Max or something like that, or .blend and you haven't actually exported any 3D file. Uh, as soon as you convert it to GLB, it's going to triangulate everything. And a lot of artists don't like that when they're working with it. So just a consideration. So the main features of GLTF are, it's a compact and efficient format for processing and rendering at runtime. Everything about GLTF is meant for, again, that real-time rendering element of things. So it's super, super efficient. Uh, it's also efficient in the way that it stores data. 
and it's easy to kind of understand what that data hierarchy looks like. It supports the geometry, the materials, uh, scene graph, they can support animation. So all the things that you would want in your asset. So let's, and it even supports lights. So let's say you've got a, uh, you've got a 3D model of, we'll say this parrot that I've got at my desk right here. You've got this parrot and you've got lights coming down on it in your scene. You can actually export those lights, those physical lights that are set up in your scene with GLTF. And if you've got an animation where it's like maybe moving across the screen, it will include those as well. So it can pretty much store everything that you want from like a visual perspective. So think about GLTF very, very visually. That's what it's for. It's to make sure that when I export this, it's going to look the way that I want it to look wherever I'm using this GLB file. Um, and it contains all of that data. Uh, let's keep going. The other thing um, about GLTF is that it's extremely extensible. Oh, hold on, I got a question coming in. Let's see this. Oh, uh, I've got, <laughs> that's my next slide that we're gonna get into in just a second. Um, so GLTF is extensible, which is super cool. So people can build custom extensions uh, on it. I'm going to dive into that a little bit later, but it's this kind of base specification that provided everyone follows it, they should be able to publish it anywhere. And then you can build things called extensions, well, which will add additional modifications later, later on. So uh, it's just it's just really exciting that we have this standardization um, with GLTF and GLB. But again, when you think GLTF, when you think GLB, which I'm going to get to in a second, think this is what I'm going to use to publish. This is what I'm going to use to show some end use case, whether it's internal or external, whatever. That's what you're thinking about it. Don't think about like, hey, I've got this GLB file um, and I'm gonna have a bunch of different artists work on different parts of it. Sure, you could do that, but that's not really what the format was designed for. So a question we get frequently, um, what is, are GLTF and uh, GLB the same? Short answer is yes, they contain all of the same data. It's just the way that they're packaged. GLB is basically, it's the binary version. What that means is it's all zipped together. So in a in a single file, but it's not a .zip, it's a .glb. With GLTF, what you get is you've got a GLTF file, you've got a bin file um, that contains a bunch of other information, that JSON structure we talked about, and then you've got your individual texture files. So if you've got, um, an asset with a bunch of materials, you might have 20 or 30 different individual files associated with that single GLTF file. And a GLB is basically the exact same thing, except it's just .GLB and all of that is stored in binary format within the asset. Um, we're almost always working with GLB files. There's not really, there are reasons, but for the most part, export a GLB will make life easier. Um, if you want to see what the individual textures you're trying to troubleshoot or something, then sure, export a GLTF. That's easy, so you can see all the individual textures that are in that file. But a GLB is just a single format. That's what we use all the time. That's what we recommend for most of the exports uh, from the various programs that our customers use. So earlier I mentioned um, GLTF extensions, and this is something that is really overlooked. Uh, when we are speaking with customers and let's say they're in Clo or Browseware or 3ds Max or whatever it is, uh, we recommend exporting a GLB file. They export that file and they're like, hey, this doesn't look the same. This doesn't look the same as what I saw in my viewport. I want it to be different. Oftentimes this can be corrected with the use of GLTF extensions. So extensions are additional um, basically it lets you add custom data to GLTF models, but still in a well-defined structure. So here on the screen, this is an example from the Kronos group who uh, invented GLTF in that format. We've got a uh, KHR materials extension for transmission on the windshield. You can see that there. We have the uh, sheen on the little kind of velvet cloth that it's sitting on. And then you've got a clear coat extension for kind of that clear coat uh, effect on the car. There's a whole list, and I'm going to include it afterwards, of extensions that are supported. The challenge is a lot of those extensions are not supported in the DCCs natively yet. 
So if you're in Clo or Browseware or even Keyshot, that support isn't quite there. Like they're not necessarily converting it. But the good news is Blender, which is free and open source, uh, does support almost all of these extensions. And there's also documentation on how you can handle that yourself. So it's definitely worthwhile to take a look at some of these extensions and see, can you get the effect that you're looking for? Because for real time, you're going to need to use this format. That's just kind of like full stop. If you if you are like, hey, we don't want to do that. We want to keep using whatever we're using. That's fine, but you will not be able to create interactive experiences on the web or in AR. And by the way, this is regardless of uh, who the, the company you're working with is. Someone might have a custom render engine that supports it, but it's not going to be something that is broad, broadly accessible. So uh, it's also not something that's supported by like Amazon or Google or um, Meta or any other places that people are starting to distribute 3D assets. You have to use GLTF. It's just kind of uh, what everyone's decided on. And it's a very good thing for the industry. All right. Okay. So USD. So USD is pretty complex, but in short, it's a way to describe like 3D scene hierarchies. A lot of people think about USD as a file format, but it's actually more of an ecosystem. So USD isn't just like, it's not the same. It's very different than GLTF being a file format or OBJ or STL or FBX or whatever it is. USD is much more powerful than that, but it's also more complex. So the problem that USD is trying to solve, and I had mentioned this, uh, that this is something GLTF does not do, is that interoperability between a bunch of different programs. So how do I take this one 3D file and have a standardized way that I can look, work on it in 3ds Max, in uh, Maya, Unreal Engine, Blender, you know, whatever program it is that you're using, how do we do that? And USD is the answer to that question. It can store huge amounts of data and have all sorts of different references between different files so that um, no matter what program you're in, it will compile correctly for that final end result. So let's, it's a little complicated. So let's just dive a little bit deeper here. So, one thing that's important to understand about USD is that it's actually comprised of lots of different files that can be edited individually. So the image on the screen here is an example of a hierarchy. And what you have is you've got, you could have a different file for materials, a different file for the geometry, a different file for the wheel geometry. Uh, so in this example, right, let's say that I have this, uh, I'm working on a project and imagine this is a lot more complex. So imagine your BMW, for instance, and you're trying to get uh, a new ver a version of a new car um, out and you're on a tight timeline. And so you need to get a bunch of different artists working on this project. Well, traditionally, if you had just like that source file, whatever program they've decided to, to work in, you have to wait until someone's finished working on that source file on that 3ds max file or for the apparel folks, uh, a .bw file or a ZPRJ and flow. The power of USD is that the final USD file is actually comprised of a bunch of individual files. So you could have someone working in a totally separate program, the program of their choice, editing the USD file that refers specifically to the geometry of the wheels. As soon as they save that, um, it will be updated in the actual USD file because it's references. So the way USD works is actually just a bunch of different references to various elements. And your USD lays out a specification for how you should describe those and what those kind of parent-child relationships should look like. But it's kind of infinite in terms of what you want to actually define. So this is this is what I'm talking about. So this is a way to kind of visualize that. So you've got this USD and then imagine that each one of these programs is maybe a different artist. They can all be working on stuff at the same time on this single scene. Uh, and when I say scene, I really mean scene. So one USD file 
right? When we think about USD file, and I put that in quotes because most people think about it as, you know, just another file format, but the USD file is actually made up of or comprised of dozens, if not hundreds of other sub files like USDA files that can be edited in any of these programs that support it. So it's really, really powerful. And that is why uh, it got developed because it was Pixar that originally created it. They were creating it for animations and we are, we're all familiar with Pixar movies. They're super complex. There's a lot going on. And USD allowed for multiple artists to be working on the scenes simultaneously without stepping on each other's toes. So it's super powerful in that respect. Um, the other reason that USD is so powerful and why you're hearing about it so much is that uh, back to that idea of storing all sorts of data about the 3D model, that's been super important for three of the biggest players in 3D, NVIDIA, Apple, and Autodesk. So the reason that they are kind of all in on USD and, and trying to support it is that number one, it gets rid of like a lot of the problems we've had in the past, which is like you're locked into the Autodesk environment or you're locked into, um, you know, whatever program it is that you're using. You've got, let's say Keyshot. And now I can't use this Keyshot file anywhere else. I have to export as an FBX. I hope that all of that data comes out of it as an FBX, and then I import it in the blender. And it's almost always loss, lossy. So what USD does is make sure that it is lossless, that you have all of the data that you need when you're editing in these different programs. But it also lets you define data on a very deep level. So one of the most interesting use cases uh, for USD is what NVIDIA is doing in their Omniverse. And rather than just defining how material looks, we talked about that with GLTF. With USD, you can actually define the physical properties of the material. So in, in NVIDIA's Omniverse, that's happening today. So if we go back to the car example, imagine if the material, the steel material for the car, had the tensile strength of that steel defined in the model. And that's what happens. So then when you're running real-time simulations in these Omniverse, it gets into an accident or something like that. Uh, it will actually respond using real world physics. So that's why this stuff is so powerful is that when we talk about digital twins, USD is the format that will actually allow you to store all of the data, all of those physical properties that exist about an object in, a real, in the real world, not just the way that it looks. So it can go a lot, lot deeper in that sense. And I think that's one of the really interesting cases that I have heard for USD and why people are super excited about it because think about what uh, Autodesk does as well. I mean, a huge part portion of Autodesk's business is uh, architecture, engineering, construction, very much the physical world. Having a format that can store all of that data in there and be interoperable between Autodesk's whole suite of products is a really big deal for them. And then making sure that format will then translate into uh NVIDIA Omniverse or be able to be rendered by NVIDIA graphics cards. That's also super powerful because now everything's streamlined. It is one format to kind of rule them all um, in terms of interoperability while you're editing these files. Okay. Um, now, this sounds very exciting, but uh, there are still a lot of challenges that are associated with USD. One of the big challenges with USD is that kind of the, um, it got released in 2016 by Pixar, it became open source, but there was no tooling released with it. And what I, what I mean by tooling is there, there wasn't a set of tools or easy way for, let's say that I'm Autodesk and I want to support um, USD. What does that relationship look like? Like, how am I mapping the, the properties that I already have in Revit or something like that. How do I map those properties to what they should be in USD? So the tooling wasn't released at the same time and it's still very much being developed. Honestly, it's not supported by most DCCs. So that's the thing is that you might be hearing a lot about it and for good reason, but it's not supported by most DCCs. If you're in the uh, fashion industry, honestly, there's not 
there's not much for you to dive into right now because it's not supported by uh, any of the programs. If you're on um, the industrial side of things, manufacturing, you'll probably be there. It's much more supported by, again, Autodesk, NVIDIA. Um, we're seeing Unreal come around to doing more with it. Unity will as well, but it's a little bit slow. Um, it, it's gotten much greater adoption there for some of the reasons that I had mentioned earlier. But it's still pretty early. It's very early for USD and its power also equals complexity. So it can be very complex when you're using um, uh, USD. So one of the challenges too is like, I, you know, when I speak to our customers, one of the battles they have is like getting enough time to educate uh, their 3D teams or really the organization generally on 3D. USD kind of adds another level of complexity with it. The other thing is that USD is not set up really for real-time rendering. It can get used in that way. It's not an either or. It's not like, no, it can't do that. But USD prioritized being able to store all of this data so that it's lossless when you move it between these different programs. But that comes at a cost from a rendering perspective. So it's not optimized for use on rendering anywhere. Um, you would not, you should not, you won't see it in the web. Uh, you're not going to see it in AR or anything like that. You see USDZ, which is the uh, basically kind of like a binary version of USD, but a huge amount of that data has been stripped out. So USD is really about kind of that that interoperability, or I'd say um, it's an exchange format while products or scenes or whatever it is you're building in 3D are being developed. Ultimately, I think we'll see a much stronger tool set for on the rendering side of things. And USD is set up that, you know, they can continue to build on this. But as of today, it's not something you're going to be using for, um, for rendering. Uh, and there's not a lot of places that support native uh, authoring of it right now. So that's kind of a, a bit of a barrier if you're trying to get into it. There are some really good resources and places you can test this out. And again, I'm going to send a, send an email after this with a bunch of links to stuff that's interesting. But today, there's still quite a few challenges associated with it. So let's kind of wrap this up with a comparison between the two. So it's definitely not an either or situation. Like they're not competing with each other. So that's like some narrative that's been picked up a little bit, but actually uh, the Kronos group has been working closely with USD's open standards. Um, they're meant to solve two different problems. Now we don't know where it's going to go. There can be some overlap there, but don't be thinking about this as an either or situation. Instead, you should be looking at it as GLTF for publishing, USD for um, interoperability during that authoring, during that creation process. GLTF has much more support right now, broadly, or GLB. So in general, um, like you probably, you probably don't have an option to even export USD. And although the goal is to have USD uh, be this kind of standardized format, even the USD authoring tools right now are not not everyone's at the same level in terms of their support for it. So it's still still pretty early in that way. The people that are adopting it the most are the most technical studios, um, movie studios, production studios, places like NVIDIA, things like that. But generally the support isn't there all around. So a few things to kind of consider. I just thought up a few questions that I figured people would be asking. Can I go from USD to GLTF? Yes, because USD contains all of this information. Then you can just export it and distill it down as a GLTF file that is optimized for publishing and um, distribution on the web, AR, et cetera. It's still going to come with the caveat that you've got to make sure your materials are set up for PBR, all the other sort of things that you run into with uh, trying to get a, a good GLB or GLTF file out. But Absolutely, you can go from USD to GLTF. Um, how does USD apply to my industry? I brought that up a little bit earlier. 
It's something to keep an eye on. It's good to have a general understanding that like, hey, this is an ecosystem. The USD is an ecosystem uh, of complex technologies, not just a single file format. I think that's helpful for everyone to know and understand. But unless you're on that uh, more industrial engineering, architecture, manufacturing side of things, I wouldn't expect to get too deep into it anytime soon. And the other thing you should consider is like, is it worth the complexity right now? I mean, if you're, if the goal is just trying to replace uh, studio photography with renders and then have 3D assets that could live on homedepot.com or Amazon or wherever else, you probably don't need that. In the future, I think it'll absolutely become an integr integral part of workflows, but we need that tooling to get updated so that it's more accessible to people. So you're not really missing anything by not using USD right now. Don't don't view it as something that is going to, uh, like you're missing the boat if you're not on top of it. It still has a ways to go. There's a lot to learn. Um, and yeah, with that, if you've got any questions, I am happy to try and answer them. Uh, Iro USD is used when one is editing AR files in iOS. Uh, GLB, yeah, the conversions are not, that's exactly it. The conversions are not one-to-one -one and USDZ uh, does not, it's not as open. It's difficult to sometimes determine why properties aren't mapping. So the question was about um, editing USD, fi USD files for use in AR. I had mentioned earlier that Apple's into uh, USDZ. That's if you view AR on an iPhone, that's the file you're viewing. But uh not everything is mapping perfectly. So again, back to my point of like, hey, things are still a little bit early. It can be a bit challenging. Nope. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for uh for attending. I will be uh we'll be sending out a recording of this. We'll also be sending out uh an email with links to things that are relevant to this that I think would be helpful. And I hope to see you all uh, at our next webinar. Have a great day.